I want to thank Jay for his help on this, and thank you all for your for your responses. Uh, some people had a little trouble getting in with the link, but we then provided the ID number and, and password. So I think everybody should be able to at least uh, get in. Um, before I introduce uh, Kai, I want to make just a few comments. Um, one of which uh, is uh, everybody who was on the either the 76 campaign or in the administration or the 80 campaign we always referred to it as the Carter Mondale campaign, the Carter Mondale administration. And I think it's important to note that uh, probably from the, with the exception of, well, at least next to Roseland, uh, uh, the president's closest partner throughout that administration was Walter Mondale. And, uh, and uh, we miss him uh, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, as Jim Free put it, uh, when he learned that the vice president had passed away, he said, he was the best of us, and and indeed he was. And uh, you can tell by the people on this call that there are Mondale people and Carter people, but we all were on the same team throughout the administration. Um, I want to thank my daughter Kirsten, uh, who's here with me. Uh, she's she's helped put this all together, and she's going to try to help us uh, stay on track. Uh, Neither one of us claimed to be technology experts, but it's fair to say she knows a hell of a lot more about it than I do, which will be of no surprise to any of you on the call. Um, uh, you know, the, the reassessment of the Carter presidency, which is now clearly picking up steam, um, really started in 2007 when Hamilton and Jay and others put together a 30th anniversary celebration of the inauguration uh, at an event at the University of Georgia which was both a reunion, but also a very substantive discussion about our time in office and the work that we did. And, the, and that reassessment has only gained uh, steam in the last few years. Uh, Stu Eisenstadt is on this call and Stu wrote a marvelous book, an extensive uh, history of the Carter presidency. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan Alter more recently uh, published a, a, another wonderful book, uh, uh, His Very Best. If you haven't read Jonathan's book, I urge you to do so. Um, uh, Barry Jagoda is on the call. Jerry, uh, Barry has written his memoirs about his time with Carter. Rob Coughlin is on the call, wrote Surfer in the White House, which is a delightful uh, reminiscence of his time in the campaign and administration. And now uh, Kai has contributed yet another very significant work uh, about, about Jimmy Carter um, and, and his presidency. Um, Jay Hakes has written a book about the energy crises that affected the, president, the presidencies of three people, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. Um, so there's a lot going on. And then two documentaries, uh, Jimmy Carter, Rock and Roll President, and Carter Land which if you haven't to uh, watch, you should, because they're fun and very inf informative. Um, Kai Bird is, as you know, a noted historian and biographer, Pulitzer Prize winning author, um, a terrific writer. Uh, and he, uh, I'm gonna ask Kai uh, uh, to talk about how he uh, took on this task of writing this book. It's a very, that in itself is an interesting story. Uh, uh, it wasn't a decision made overnight. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's fair to say, Kai, that when you started, uh, you, you were at first prompted by the Camp David Accords and the story behind that. As you got into that, you realized there was so much more to the story. And as you got more into that, you realized you really needed to write a biography and go back into <laughs> Carter's childhood and formative years and early days in politics and all the rest. Um, so I'm going to have Kai talk for as long as he wants. Um, uh, and then I'll have some questions for him. And uh, if you have questions, uh, I would ask you to use the chat feature rather than getting into a discussion with now over 100 people. Uh, so uh, one last word about Kai. I, I was fortunate uh, to have time with him. Uh, 
Unfortunately, he quoted me a few times with complete <laughs> accuracy. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, he's a terrific guy. Uh, not only a great writer and historian, but just a, a wonderful guy to spend time with, as I think you'll, you'll all appreciate as this discussion goes along. The book will be out June 15th. Uh, you can pre-order now, uh, and uh, it will be available, obviously, hard copy, audiobook, and, and all the rest. But with that, Kai, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, uh, let you talk for a few minutes, uh, or as I say, as long as you want, and then I've got some questions for you. So take it away. Okay. All right, Les, thank you very much for that very kind and fulsome introduction. Um, I'm, I'm really gratified to be with this audience and, and uh, it's a great opportunity for me to talk with some of you again. I'm a little intimidated because I know that uh, all of you people are gonna be my most informed readers <laughs> and you'll know all the things I've glossed over or the details I've not gotten quite right or uh, the issues I didn't cover, but you know, that's one of the pitfalls of a presidential biography. It's just incredible the number of issues um, and people and um, <clears throat> anecdotes that uh, happen to a president every day. The papers that cross his desk, it's, you know, from foreign policy to domestic and it's just very intimidating as a biographer. It's very different to write a biography of a president than um, almost any other kind of subject. Uh, it's a, so I, I hope I've done some justice to the subject, but let me, uh, let me get to your question. Um, you know, this book has sort of been in the making for not years, but decades. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, after I finished, finished my first book on a biography of John McCloy, a powerful Wall Street lawyer and banker, um, I was casting around for a, a new subject. And in the McCloy book, I had had to write at some length about the Iran hostage crisis, because McCloy was deeply involved in that. And as you'll see in, in The Outlier, uh, he pops up again. He's a critical player and uh, lobbying Carter to admit the Shah for political asylum, which precipitates the hostage crisis. And uh, so it's that sort of writing about that regarding McCloy got me interested in Carter. And uh, so I, this is back in 1990 when I was finishing up the McCloy book. And I mentioned to the magazine editor, Victor Navasky, the editor of the Nation magazine, that I was interested in possibly doing a presidential biography and, uh, of Carter. And he says, oh, well, the way to explore this topic is for you to write an essay for the magazine about what Carter's doing with his ex-presidency. The Carter Center was just about opening up. And it was just 10 years after Carter had left the White House. So I, I uh, took that magazine assignment. I went down to Atlanta and spent two weeks. And I interviewed a bunch of people at the Carter Center and, uh, you know, had a, a lot of fun. I had a very short telephone interview with President Carter himself and wrote a, I thought, a damn good piece on what Carter was doing. Uh, with the Carter Center and his ex-presidency, uh, which appeared as a cover story in the Nation magazine in the fall of 1990. But the experience, the reporting experience, persuaded me that uh, it was, A, too early to do a Carter biography because the archives, the presidential papers were still largely closed. And B, I was the wrong guy to do it because I realized that I didn't understand the South. I didn't understand religion and Southern Baptists. <laughs> I didn't understand race in America. Uh, 
And I sort of, I got intimidated and I came back to Washington and I remember telling my wife, Susan, that if I did this, we'd have to move to Plains, Georgia and settle into South Georgia for several years. And I'd have to be like a foreign correspondent learning the lay of the land in South Georgia. <laughs> and my wife said, no way, I'm not moving to Plains. <laughs> So uh, I backed off the project then and went on to something else, a biography of the Bundy brothers and then Robert Oppenheimer and some other projects. But finally in 2015, I came back to the subject. Uh, well, I was just saying, you know, I, I finally in 2015 sat down and wrote a proposal and sold it to uh, uh, Crown Books in New York. And then a few weeks later, Carter had that amazing press conference where he announced that he had brain cancer. And so I thought, oh my God, I'm not gonna have a chance to interview him. Um, but of course, as we all know, he survived that. And uh, six years later now, uh, I've managed to produce the book. And I have to admit, if the pandemic had not hit last year, I'd probably still be working on the book. <laughs> uh, but, <clears throat> So the pandemic, you know, forced this writer to do what writers need to do, be alone and be with themselves and their computer and it's just right. Uh, so that, <clears throat> I guess that sort of answers how I got into this project. It was, you know, 25 years in the making essentially. And, um, but I've had a great time and I'm really quite proud of the, the book and the cover, which is a photo taken by Rosalind Fox Solomon, who uh, is still with us. She's in her 90s and she was a terrific photographer who came down to Plains in the summer of 76 and took a slew of photographs of Carter. And they were all very, quite unusual, black and white. Um, and I, I think the cover photo really captures Carter's intensity. Um, uh, uh, Kai, uh, talk a little bit. I, I, I hadn't prepped you with this question, but the title is fascinating. Uh, the Outlier, uh, yeah. the Unfinished Presidency. Can you talk about that? And then uh, we'll go to some, some other questions. Uh, <clears throat> you know, titles are really hard. Um, and I bandied about a bunch of titles, but this was actually the working title of my, my book proposal back in 2015. Because after doing a, you know, my proposal was about 40, 40 or 50 pages. And, you know, after doing a little bit of research, I, I, I had begun to think of Carter as someone who was an outlier, both in terms of his intelligence, but also his politics. Um, and I, I liked, the, I liked the, the title because it was short and punchy, but even a year ago, we were still debating other titles and uh, I, I just, I bandied around a bunch of them, but I thought this was, this said it, so. Okay. Um, sort of on the same vein in terms of your research, uh, uh, and the and the reflections that that research led you to. Um, what are the two or three biggest surprises for you uh, in the research and in your reflections? Things that just sort of might have been, you know, aha moments uh, that you didn't expect. Right. Uh, well, I think. There were two surprises to me. One in terms of the research. Uh, I kept hearing the name Charlie Kerbo as I interviewed people. And as I plowed my way through box after box in the presidential library, uh, you know, Kerbo's name came up quite a bit. And I'd read a oral history that he gave after leaving after Carter left the White House. 
And uh, I was intrigued by him because, partly because he reminded me of John McCloy, a guy who was behind the scenes, a lawyer, an advisor to presidents. And uh, people, I kept, you know, hearing his name from people that I was interviewing as, you know, Kerbo's the key. And in Kerbo's oral history, he recounts how he often told, uh, he, he came up, he refused to take a job in the White House, actually. Carter wanted him as his chief of staff initially, um, but Kerbo said no to that and stayed in Atlanta, but he'd come up frequently. Um, and uh, he also, according to his oral history, wrote many memos and letters to Carter. Um, so in my very first interview with Carter, I uh, had the wisdom or the good fortune to just ask the president, well, you know, <clears throat> I know that Kerbo was a good friend and important to you, but none of his memos or very few of his memos and, and letters are in the presidential library. And he expressed surprise at that. He stopped and, you know, queried me about that. Uh, and uh, I, I assured him that, you know, there were no extensive memos, hundreds of pages is what Kerbo claimed in his oral history. So uh, Carter turned to Steve Hockman, his aide who was sitting in on the interview and said, well, you know, let's investigate this. Let's see if we can find out where those papers are. So about three days later, Steve called me and said, we found them. There are four or five boxes, cardboard boxes in Kerbo's attic, in the widow's attic. Kerbo had passed on by now, by then of course, but his widow was still alive and the papers were sitting in his attic. And so eventually, uh, Terry Adamson and others arranged for me to get access to those boxes. And those papers were fabulous. That was the biggest surprise in my research. Um, they gave me a view of uh, sort of an insider's view of the president's thinking from his closest confidant, um, of the man who was sort of closest to him in age and uh, who had been with him since 1962, since his first run for the state Senate in Georgia. And uh, you see Kerbo, uh, well, you see Kerbo giving really astute political advice, <clears throat> how to run for the governorship, how to weave through these minefields of race and how to ap appeal to the black community, but also to poor rural whites, um, how to deal with the George Wallace problem, uh, how to talk about the Vietnam War, which was still raging. Um, and, uh, and the other surprise about Kerbo to me was that he, well, you know, he's described often by people as sort of the Atticus Finch, <laughs> a, uh, a slow talking Southern South Georgia drawl, uh, very soft spoken, but uh, obviously clever and smart. And uh, he was also clearly from his memos, he was, uh, well, it's hard to pin, pin him down politically, but he had a populist, a sort of Southern populist view of politics, a suspicion of big corporations, a suspicion of wealthy influence, uh, influential people who would use their money politically. And he and Carter were on the same, same wavelength, obviously. Anyway, that was my biggest research surprise. Um, the biggest sort of lesson I learned from digging into Carter's personality and his, his uh, dealings with people was, you know, people, to this day sort of have this image of President Carter as a uh, uh, liberal, uh, soft, uh, humanitarian, 
In fact, he is a really tough cookie. <laughs> he's, he's very tough and driven and determined. And, uh, you know, it's just the opposite of the pub public perception. And this was brought home to me in an uh, interview that Hunter Thompson gave to Rolling Stone, where he called Carter the, the meanest politician he'd ever met. And what he meant, of course, was, you know, Carter was driven. He was determined. He knew how to get elected. And uh, he was willing to do whatever it took to, to achieve an electoral victory, particularly in the governor's race and then for the presidency. Um, so I, I, that was sort of a surprise to me. Uh, the revelations about Mr. Kerbo and his correspondence and whatnot, uh, I think uh, others on the call who uh, worked in the White House in the administration. Uh, there are very few people, uh, you we referred to the president as Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Mrs. Carter, uh, and it was Mr. Kerbo. Uh, <laughs> right. And uh, um, I, I think that was true of, of, of all of us, uh, including Hamilton and Frank and Stu, who were, you know, much more in the thick of things than, than I would. Um, before we get into some specific policy things, Kai, um, you, you go into some detail about the role of Mrs. Carter uh, and her influence on the president. Um, and I think it's fair to say that you, you, these are my words to describe what I read. And thank you. I, I have the advantage, folks, that uh, Kai sent me a pre-publication copy so I could prepare for this uh, uh, discussion. So I have a head start. But you uh, you basically say, in not so many words, that uh, Mrs. Carter had a more finely tuned political sense uh, than did her husband, that she was more political or more political sensitive. Can you talk uh, a bit about that and how it played out uh, in campaigns and in the, in the presidency? Yes, well, she was actually a surprise too. Um, you know, she, she, she comes from South Georgia, from Plains. She never went, she went only to college for a year or so. And, but she too is an extremely sharp, and tough personality um, and strongly opinionated. And uh, she clearly had a uh, political sensibility that I think, you know, was cultivated by her months and months on the campaign trail. Um, but <clears throat> she was the one who constantly, once Carter, you know, this is the thing about Carter, that I, is, a, is the paradox, I think, is that he was uh, very political in his uh, strategy for winning elections. And uh, then once he won the presidency, once he's in the White House, he turned around and decided that he wasn't going to pay a, much attention to the politics of any issue. You know, again, people repeatedly when I interviewed them told me, oh, you know, if uh, <clears throat> you wanted Carter to cut you off, uh, you would start talking about the politics of an issue. He didn't want to hear the politics. He wanted to know what was the right thing to do, what was the smart, intelligent thing to, to solve this policy problem. And uh, he would proceed to do that. And Rose, Rosie, as, she, as he called her, uh, had a political sense that said, you know, and she constantly complained to Jimmy, like, well, when are you going to start paying attention to the politics? You know, these are, you're paying a very heavy political cost. Don't you want a second term? And uh, he would put her off. So yes, you're right. She, she had a, a political sense that uh, Carter shared, but refused, you know, wanted to ignore because he wanted to do the right thing. Um, 
you mentioned uh, uh, 1990 and, and what you knew or concluded you didn't know about the South or race in America. Uh, this is a bit of a curveball, but I, I want to go back to that. Uh, what, what do you uh, what do you think you understand now? Uh, as a result of your research or reflection that you didn't understand that? I mean, what key points? Uh, that race is central to everything in America. <laughs> you know, back in 1990, I was, uh, I was 39 years old. I, I uh, had grown up actually overseas. I was an expat. My father was a foreign service officer. So I grew up in the Middle East and India and came back to go to college in 1969 in the midst of the Vietnam War. And uh, so I knew nothing really about uh, the African-American experience or the, the role of races in, in uh, American politics. And, you know, it race is just, we're living with it today. It's just, uh, it's in the headlines every day. And, uh, you know, if you want to ask what's the one thing about what marks the Carter presidency? Well, it's a window into America's troubled relations with race. And here you have this Southern white guy who in the 1950s and 60s, man is a, is a liberal, but he keeps his head down and he is trying to run a business in Plains, Georgia. And down the road, seven miles away is Clarence Jordan, who happens to be the uncle of Hamilton Jordan. And Clarence Jordan had started an interracial commune in 1940 in South Georgia and where blacks and whites shared dinner together at the same table and worked together and lived together. And, you know, Clarence Jordan was a radical in terms of the issue of race in, in, in the South. And yet he was able to get away with it because it was such a small operation, I think. Anyway, Carter is similar. He's like, you know, he's trying to make his way in South Georgia politics. And yet when he finally wins the governorship on the day he's inaugurated, he announces that the time for segregation in the South is over and shocks his own political constituency and, and you know he's from that day on I think he's beginning to run for the presidency and he has a sensibility he's the the first first presidential candidate first governor in in Georgia who actually goes into black churches and is completely at ease with African Americans and campaigning in a church like that. He's, you know, big, and it's, as you can, you'll see in the book, of course, he, he's raised, his whole childhood was among African Americans. His, his uh, childhood playmates were African Americans. He, he's, he's a white Southern man who, whose father was, you know, believed in white supremacy. And yet he had this mother, Miss Lillian, who was a completely, you know, outlier <laughs> and gave her son a, a sensibility about race that was very similar to Clarence Jordan's. Um, and once Carter was in a position of power, uh, he used that sensibility, Miss Lillian's views of race to try to bring the new South to a, a, a new level. And of course he won the presidency with the new South. And of course in 1980, he lost the presidency because of the South in part, you know, he, because those, there was a backlash. Um, now Carter is just, he's, he's still 
just a, a completely complicated um, enigma to me. Um, at one point, I, I, I early in the book, I try to explain that uh, one of the things that motivated Carter or, or allowed him to uh, mesh his ambition, his political ambition with his religiosity was reading R Reinhold Niebuhr, the uh, Northern theologian who had a uh, argument about politics that suggested that you cannot do good unless you have power. And once you have power, that's the only, you know, you your responsibility is to do good. And this is, this actually, C Carter was very impressed by Niebuhr's writings. I sort of call him a Niebuhrian Southern Baptist, a church of one. <laughs> and, but this is how Carter justified both his political ambition and his determination once he was in a position of power to try to do the right thing. And he tried to do the right thing on race, appointing you know, more African-Americans and Hispanics to the federal bench than all of his predecessors put together. Um, he tried to expand the food stamp program to largely rural black poor in the South. Um, and of course he won the, the votes of those kinds of voters in both 76 and 80. But in 1980, he lost Southern middle-class whites yeah. and middle-class voters all over America because I think of partly because of race. Um, I, I was going to mention, Kai, that the African-American community was, was a steady, solid, and crucial part of uh, the 76 campaign and a couple of rough moments and they stuck with Carter. They stuck with us uh, in the White House and in 1980 when we were challenged from the left by Senator Kennedy. Right. Uh, the African American community was was central, not just in the rural South, but but across the country. Um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to switch gears that. Um, uh, uh, Frank Moore, who's on this call, used to have me attend a lot of the, uh, the policy briefings and budget briefings and whatnot uh, with the uh, various cabinet members. And I remember, I'm going to cite Stu Eisenstadt in this, but I remember vividly uh, uh, one time in the uh, Secretary Califano was briefing the president in the cabinet room on what was going to be our welfare reform package. And he went into, the secretary went into what I call agonizing in granular detail, probably even, I mean, even by Carter standards, it was pretty granular. <laughs> and uh, at, at one point, the president had, interrupt, had to interrupt the briefing to take a call from uh, the Senate Majority Leader, Robert Byrd. And when Carter left the room, Stu said, Quip something in that, this, Stu, this is not an exact quote, but something along the lines of, is it any wonder why presidents gravitate to foreign policy once in office? Uh, the, the discussion's always more interesting and you can do so much more directly. Uh, uh, with that sort of notion in mind, can you talk about uh, Carter's successes uh, in the foreign policy arena and, uh, you know, the setbacks that. Uh... Yeah. No, it's astonishing how much he accomplished in those four years and uh, how determined he was to take on the most difficult of problems. So, you know, he tackled right off the bat the Panama Canal Treaty and paid a very heavy political cost for this. Uh, he tackled SALT II negotiations, China normalization, immigration reform eventually, and of course, human rights. And of course, the big thing was the Middle East. And, you know, it, it's, it's sort of curious, why did Carter tackle from the very beginning? You know, it was the spring of 1977 that he began working and spending a lot of time on uh, Israel, Palestine, Egypt, um, trying to 
to broker a peace, which, as we all know, is a really difficult nut to crack and is it's still a problem with us. But he, uh, you know, as we all know, he did Camp David. He forced these uh, two very unlikely uh, politicians, Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat, to come to Camp David and iron out a, a, a peace treaty eventually. But again, an enormous political cost. And uh, just as a diversion, I, in my book, I, I make the argument that uh, Carter not only achieved taking Egypt off the battlefield for Israel, but he also, in his mind, he believed that he had negotiated the beginnings, the framework for a settlement of the Palestinian problem as well, in terms of Palestinian autonomy, which he thought would lead to a two-state solution. And the key, of course, is the issue of uh, did he get Menachem Begin to agree to a freeze of the settlements uh, for five years instead of just uh, three or four months as you know, most historians seem to think that it was this was a muddled negotiation that uh, Carter didn't pin down things. But, you know, in my view, uh, Carter is a, the guy who pays attention to details most in any negotiation. I mean, he he looks at the 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 tiniest of details. And I think he believes in his mind that he got Begin to agree to a five-year freeze. And I know this is controversial, but uh, uh, you know, it's, if you look at Carter's diaries and, and the, the context of the negotiations on that last Saturday and Sunday at Camp David, uh, I, I think it, it happened. Um, and of course, Begin walked back from it almost immediately. And this is the great tragedy of Camp David and something that we're still living with today because the settlements have exploded in terms of population and numbers, and they're making it in, uh, increasingly impossible to envision a two-state solution. So anyway, he had enormous foreign policy victories uh, and, uh, and also uh, ultimately, the Palestinian-Israeli thing was uh, a tragedy, too. But, of course, we're now also still dealing with Iran, and that was the big failure, of course. Uh, but it was something that was organically going to happen. The Iran revolution was not something that Carter could have done anything to prevent uh, the Shah was becoming more and more un unpopular. The revolution was going to happen, and it turned out to be a, a viscerally theocratic, radical uh, revolution led by this Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, and you know, it's it was it was something that ultimately ended the Carter presidency. I guess people often told me that, there, that the problem with Carter, the reason Carter didn't get reelected was the three K's. <laughs> Khomeini, uh, <coughs> Ed Koch, and Kennedy. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, Khomeini okay. was the big one. Hamilton once said, we could beat Kennedy or Khomeini, we couldn't beat them both. Um, yeah. Uh, staying in the uh, in the foreign policy arena for a second, uh, I'm going to raise two issues. One I would describe as somewhat touchy; the other potentially explosive. Um, the touchy one is that you take a very and David Aaron is on the call. Madeline may be on the call. I'm not sure. You take a very critical look at uh, National Security Advisor Brzezinski. Uh, I mean, you're really tough on him. Um, uh, and, and at length, I mean, it's not just passing stuff. Um, uh, and I came away from reading your book thinking that Brzezinski was really seemed to be running in your accounting, his own foreign policy shop at the White House 
frequently at odds with the State Department. We all know that there were tensions between Brzezinski and Vance, but it was more than that, it seems to me, um, in reading your book. Can you comment on that? And am I overstating your conclusion? And, and the, as I say, there are people uh, in the group who may want to comment later uh, uh, via chat or email, and I invite them to do so. And I'm going to go to the second question while, while we're in the, this area. The, the explosive territory has to do with the so-called October surprise. You mentioned the, the Iranian hostages and, and, and the fact that that doomed our re-election chances. Um, and, and that has to do with how the Reagan-Bush campaign, uh, I think, acted at a minimum inappropriately, and I'm going to say perhaps treasonously uh, in your accounting. And, and you, you connect dots that others have looked at but have never connected before in your book. So I want you to talk about that. But first take on the Brzezinski versus State Department question and then the October surprise. Right. Well, let's begin with, with Zbig. Uh, yeah, no, I write a lot about Zbig and Vance and Carter. And uh, from the very beginning, uh, Carter was advised repeatedly by people like Richard Holbrook. Oh, you know, Zbig is a smart guy. Vance is a smart guy. They're very knowledgeable, but you can't have both of them uh, because they have two different views on foreign policy. Their, their world views are completely di divergent. Um, and Carter liked that idea. <laughs> he, uh, he, you know, he personally liked Brzezinski and he liked intellectually sparring with him. And you recall that it was Brzezinski who uh, first sort of brought Carter into the well, Brzezinski and David Rockefeller into the Trilateral Commission. And Brzezinski became sort of a, a teacher to Carter on foreign policy issues, on the Middle East in particular, but on Russia in, in a big way. And, uh, you know, Car Carter wasn't a foreign policy wonk coming from South Georgia. So he was attracted to the, the intellectual side of Brzezinski. He liked sparring with him, but he disagreed with him most of the time. <laughs> and it's clear from the memos uh, that from the very beginning in 1977, uh, Zvig is constantly pushing Carter to be more confrontational. To uh, He writes a memo at one point saying, you know, you, you need to look tough. You need to uh, make the Russians fear you. Uh, you need to do something uh, that is uh, confrontational. And Carter writes in the margins, like Mayaguez, referring to the Mayaguez disaster that Ford, Jerry Ford had sustained under, with, hen, under Henry Kissinger's advice that was you know, a show, show of force that went wildly wrong and led to the deaths of people unnecessarily. Uh, Carter understood that the use of power uh, in foreign policy, military power should be used very sparingly, that it led, it could lead to un, unforeseen consequences. Brzezinski had, again, his memos are just, it, the evidence is overwhelming. I couldn't resist, you know, writing about this at length, but, Brzezinski is constantly focused on the danger of the Russians. And it clearly comes from his whole worldview as a Polish American who, you know, is a refugee from communist Poland and, and he hates the Russians. He just hates the Russians. And he thinks that he's, that we're in a, a generational, multi-generational cold war with the Russians and that we have to be tough. And he thinks that Carter's is, you know, the human rights stuff is, is too soft. And he's constantly advising Carter to do things that Carter does not want to do. Carter repeatedly sides with Vance, particularly in the first three years. 
And only at the end, sort of after the Russian invasion of Afghanistan um, uh, and after the Iranian revolution, does he begin to sort of concede to Br Brzezinski some of those decisions. So it's Brzezinski who, for instance, persuades him to do the helicopter rescue mission, which turned out to be a disaster. And in my view, was always going to be a disaster. Um, no, so I'm I, you're right, I am very tough on Brzezinski, but I'll admit that I can't explain the mystery to this day. Why, if Carter disagreed with Brzezinski so strongly <laughs> and repeatedly rejected his advice and sided with Cy Vance, uh, why did he tolerate Brzezinski throughout the four years? And why was it Vance who left? and had to resign, not Brzezinski. It's, uh, it's, it's still sort of a mystery to me. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so then you, your second question was uh, about the Iran, the, the uh, October surprise. And, you know, this is, unfortunately, it's a conspiracy story. And most conspiracies are probably fantasies. Most conspiracies didn't happen. You know, in, historians realize that uh, things happen in the course of human events, often by accident, and uh, there's rarely a concerted conspiracy. But there are some conspiracies that turn out to be true. <laughs> and, uh, and I believe I, I show in this uh, rather concise, short chapter, it's a complicated story, but it all boils down to one question. Did Bill Casey, Ronald Reagan's campaign manager in the summer of 1980, take a trip to London and then fly into Madrid, Spain and meet with a uh, representative of the Ayatollah Khomeini? And, <coughs> you know, there was a congressional investigation of this and it they could not find the evidence. Well, there is a memo that has emerged. Uh, I didn't find it, but I found a reporter, Robert Perry, who dug it out from the uh, Bush One Presidential Archive. Uh, and it's a memo dated 1990, uh, 1991, uh, in which they're responding to a subpoena from Lee Hamilton's October Surprise Task Force in the House of Representatives. Uh, and that was a subpoena for any documents related to uh, the allegations that were surfacing that there had been an October surprise, that uh, the Iranians had been sent a signal by the Reagan campaign in 1980. And this memo uh, refers to documents that were gathered in response for, to, for the, to the subpoena. And they say, well, there is this memo from the Madrid embassy in Spain uh, reporting that Bill Casey is in town, quote, for purposes unknown. I think that's a smoking gun. It proves that the embassy was reporting that Casey was in Madrid, Spain in the summer of 1980. And why else would he have gone there there was no other reason than to meet with the Iranians. And, you know, it fits with Bill Casey. He's a OSS veteran, the, the best part of, you know, the, 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 the love of his life, the best experience in his life was during World War II when he was working for the OSS out of London running covert operations. And Casey loved intrigue. And I, I think this, he went off, he, he loved the notion of having a back channel and exploring with the Iranians. And he, I think he went and told them, you know, we, Ronald Reagan, my candidate can give you a better deal. Now, Ronald Reagan didn't need to know about this. This was just Casey doing his thing. But it is, if this happened, and I believe it happened, I think this is the seeds of the whole Iran-Contra scandal that broke yeah. Five, six years later. Yeah. Under Bill Casey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
And we also know, and knew at the time, that the Reagan people were just scared to death about a quote October surprise meeting, a resolution of the hostage crisis before the election. And, and so from their standpoint, anything they could do to bollocks up the, that process, you know, while wrong, <laughs> you know, they, they clearly, and, and you point out not only was Casey in Madrid, but the Iranian representatives were in Madrid at that time too. Right. I mean, oh, yeah. Hotel and travel records and so forth. Uh, 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 Terry Smith has uh, asked a question and it relates to this. And that has to do with uh, the decision to let the Shah into the United States, which was a, a, a pivotal moment in all the, this. And and, and you do go into this in, in uh, detail, the, the role of the, I'm trying to think, uh, Eagle, you know, what was it called? The, uh, well, the, the, the Kissinger Rockefeller. Project Alpha. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the pressure. Yeah, this, is the, the, this is the extraordinary thing. Um, you know, Carter, again, had very good judgment. His in, instinct was, no, we shouldn't give the Shah asylum. This is too inflammatory. It will, uh, you know, uh, anger the Iranians in the streets and give Khomeini an excuse to attack us further and perhaps take over our embassy. I mean, he even, you know, speculated about this in his diary. So his his instincts were quite commonsensical, um, and yet he was surrounded by. Uh, members of the foreign policy establishment, we're getting back to John McCloy, David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, but also Brzezinski, uh, who lobbied him, you know, just incessantly for months and months and making the argument that this, by refusing to give the Shah asylum, we were turning our back on an ally and this would send a message to, other allies, you know, that America was unreliable. And Carter kept arguing with them saying, no, this is, you know, going to endanger uh, our re relations with the new regime. It's uh, needless, uh, you know, the, sh the Shah can find medical, uh, even, even when he understood that there were medical problems, he said, well, they're, they're, they could, he could find medical uh, solutions to his problems elsewhere. But when he finally was confronted, <coughs> you know, it was Vance who actually changed his mind with, with the evidence that he had cancer and that he wanted uh, medical treatment at Sloan Kettering. Vance changed his mind and, and recommended to Carter that, you know, we really on humanitarian grounds should admit the Shah. Uh, you know, Carter un, un, did it, but re reluctantly. And of course, what happened was predictable. And Kissinger and Rockefeller, they, you know, it's, they actually spent, they had a budget from Chase Manhattan Bank and they seconded uh, a lawyer from Milbank Tweed, Hadley and McCloy to work full time on this. And Rockefeller hired a well-known publicist uh, and they spent $40,000 giving an adv book advance to some academic to write about uh, the poor Shah. Uh, they spent, you know, thousands of dollars uh, lobbying Washington, taking out, taking people like Ambassador Don McHenry out to lunch in New York, or McCloy coming down and having lunch with Carter and raising the issue of the Shah. Uh, they were just relentless and. Brzezinski himself began to nag Carter about it, and they argued about this. And yet, Carter, you know, in the end, largely because he was persuaded by the humanitarian argument, he gave in, and with all the consequences that we know about. Uh, let's now turn to domestic uh, issues and politics. Um, uh, Stu writes about this in his book, Jonathan in his book. Uh, uh, they, they both make the point, you make the point, 
that that Carter's domestic or his policy achievements generally, but his particular domestic policy, stand in in very positive contrast to the first terms or only terms of of other presidents. Uh, without asking you to go do an inventory of all of those achievements, but you might mention, uh, you know, a few of them. But so many of us, and some of the questions I've been getting, sort of go to the point. We had these tremendous achievements, both in magnitude and in number. And why is it, if you can answer this question, it's even painful to ask, why is it that he and those of us who were involved at the time were seen as failures? Uh, I mean, the obvious answer is if you lose re-election, that's the ultimate verdict, right? But, but um, uh, we have this 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 list, and and uh, and I wonder if you just talk about that uh, and and wrestle with the question about how did we end up <laughs> where right. we did. Right. Well, you know, the list is obvious. You, you all you people know it. Uh, it's you know Joan Claybrook, uh, Nader, Raiders Nader kind of background is appointed to the auto safety board and, and she, with Carter's strong support gets seat belts and airbags through. And that, you know, that saves 9,000 lives a year. That's a major, major achievement that we're, we're still benefiting from. You know, he deregulates uh, the airlines so middle-class Americans can begin to, to fly on a routine basis. Likewise, the trucking industry, natural gas, uh, you know, he he created this huge wilderness wilderness area in Alaska. He, uh, you know, if, if anyone loves to drink beer in this country, well, they owe the fact that boutique beers and all over <laughs> every city in America exists only because Carter made that happen in in a small way. But uh, and you know, he was a <clears throat> he was saddled with stagflation and high interest rates and inflation, and he did the really politically tough thing of appointing Paul Volcker, knowing that this is going to come with heavy political costs. But it was Volcker's policies starting in, in late 79 that ultimately broke the back of inflation. And yet Reagan gets credit for this. Uh, you know, why, you, you ask why does Carter, why is he still perceived as sort of a weak president, a president that didn't accomplish very much? Well, it was 40 years ago and people don't pay attention to history and they're just ignorant of what, of the accomplishments. But there were also, you know, battles that he lost and he was, uh, he wasn't exactly politically adept at uh, some of these battles. So for instance, the big thing that I think, you know, the big tragedy domestically that where he failed was his, his, on the issue of national health care. And of course he campaigned for it in 76 and he gets into the White House and he wants to have a national health insurance act, but uh, it, he re quickly regard, looks at the Kennedy bill and decides that it's A, it doesn't have the votes, can't get passed in Congress, and B, it's too expensive. Um, and he, Carter is, you know, a fiscally conservative Democrat in that way. He wants to balance the budget. Uh, and so he, he goes to Kennedy and he tries to persuade Kennedy to sign on to a national catastrophic health care bill. And Kennedy won't go for it. And Carter, you know, digs in and Kennedy digs in and uh, Kennedy uses this issue, of course, to, uh, as an excuse, his major campaign issue to, to run, run for the nomination himself. And Carter is very resentful of these, you know, what we talked earlier about Kerbo's Southern populism. He's, you know, resented the, the Kennedy Camelot presumption of, uh, of 
that they were entitled to the presidency and and he he Kennedy and he just were you know they clashed personally it was bad chemistry um, but on this issue of national health insurance they could have come to some kind of compromise um, if each of them had been willing to come you know get off their their positions and I think Carter's was uh, a, a pretty reasonable position in that he could have, if he had gotten catastrophic health care passed, uh, that would have been an enormous foot in the door. And well, we did he, get the children's health care. I mean, yeah. he made steps. Yeah. He, uh, I, uh, I took a sort of cynical position at the time. I remember having a pretty vigorous argument, argument with Hamilton about this. My thought was if we embrace the Kennedy bill, it would take away Kennedy's excuse for running. It wasn't going to pass anyway, so we didn't right. have to worry about the, the costs and, and whatnot. I mean, right. But that's an example of Carter refusing to do the politically correct thing to play. You know, the uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, in your discussions with Carter and, and uh, research and reflections, uh, what do you think he is a most proud of in his presidency, and, um, and and you may have already covered this, but what what's the greatest misunderstanding that we may still be saddled with about Jimmy Carter and his presidency? Oh, let's see. I guess the biggest misunderstanding is the tennis courts. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's, that's, sadly, that's one of the, the single most memorable anecdotes that the average American citizen is going to, if they've read anything about Carter, they know that he paid so much attention to detail that he was even uh, administering the, the schedule for the White House tennis court. And it wasn't really true. And uh, it, you know, we have... James Fallows to blame for this uh, story. And uh, I explain in the book how Fallows came to the conclusion that Carter was doing this. But Fallows was, you know, didn't have all the facts. And it was Susan Clow who was actually managing the tennis. <laughs> and it was Carter's own sort of uh, decision early on to open up the tennis court to White House staff, which normally hadn't been the practice. And so one day he goes down to the tennis court to play a game with one of his sons and the court is occupied. And instead of kicking those people off the court, he goes back to the Oval Office and tells Susan Cloud to set up a schedule, a sign up sheet. And so Susan manages it. But uh, anyway, that, that's one, one of the misunderstandings. Um, uh, but you're right. I, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's sad that uh, people don't realize that he did accomplish an enormous amount. He passed more legislation domestically than uh, Bill Clinton or, I would argue, Obama um, put together. Um, and, you know, there are reasons for that. He had a Democratic House and Senate. Um, and... Bill Clinton and Obama didn't for part of their terms. So, uh, but it's uh, it's also I would argue that his image as a failed presidency is related not only to the fact that he didn't win a second term, but it, it comes back to the issue of the South and race. And you know he was a Southern white man who. Uh, came from nowhere. He ran uh, sort of tongue in cheek as a peanut farmer. And then he arrives in the White House and uh, there's a cultural disconnect. And the Washington establishment just didn't understand Carter, didn't like his, his South Georgia draw, didn't understand uh, where he was coming from as a Southern liberal and made fun of them. There, you know, the cartoonists, of course, had a field day with 
uh, portraying him in, uh, in jeans and as a sort of country bumpkin. Uh, and, but it was also the Georgetown set uh, that just made fun of him. Sally Quinn in the Washington Post uh, just fed into the sort of stereotypes that Northerners have of uh, the South. And Carter didn't, and Hamilton Jordan and Jody Powell, we haven't mentioned Jody Powell, who was a brilliant press secretary. And uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were part of a sort of Georgia mafia. Um, that's who Carter surrounded himself with. And so part of the political cost of that was that he was caricatured. Uh, he fed into the, the caricature of the Southern, um, the Southern white guy. Um, and, but I don't know, he, he also made mistakes and not sort of reaching out to, you know, he could, have, he could have wooed and seduced the Georgetown set. And in one of my interviews, I did get President Carter to admit that it probably was a mistake to, for him to have turned down so many invitations from Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post, who was constantly trying to come get the president to come to her house in, in Georgetown. And, and Carter was too busy to, you know, that was the last thing he wanted to do is spend time at a cocktail party. Um, he, you know, he was, uh, without a doubt, looking back, he has been our hardest working president, putting in the longest hours, reading 200, 300 pages a day of memos. Can you imagine Donald Trump reading 300 pages of memos every day? <laughs> it's hard to imagine reading 10. <laughs> uh, anyway. Well, there was, there's no question. We, we were all aware of it at the time that there was a, uh, there was a prejudice against, uh, if you will, uh, Carter and, and, and his, there was a regional prejudice uh, by folks in the Northeast and the, as you call it, the Georgetown set. Uh, and uh, we just weren't able to overcome it. We, we probably could have done more to try to overcome it, no question about that. Uh, but we were also just trying to do our job. The other thing, the misperception, I think, about the so-called Georgia Mafia, yeah, so many of the president's closest advisors had come from Georgia and worked with him as governor. Uh, but, but he and they were very open uh, to others. Uh, and there are a lot of people on this call who are testimony to that fact. I mean, you know, I, I had traveled to the Atlanta airport many times, but I can't claim to have been a Georgian. I mean, <laughs> right. You know. No, absolutely. Uh, um, I, I want to go back uh, to the early part of the discussion. You know, we, we talked about the Carter Mondale administration. Can you talk uh, a bit about the relationship between the president and the vice president and uh, how it came to be and how it uh, played out uh, in office? Because that is, a, I think, one of the more important historical facts about, about the Carter presidency was the elevation of the vice presidency, but I'll Absolutely. let you talk about he, that. He, he and Mondale created the modern vice presidency. Um, and, you know, coming back to Kerbo, uh, I, I tell this anecdote in the book that, you know, Kerbo was uh, vetting a lot of the appointments during that transition period in 76, early 77. And that included uh, vetting the vice presidency candidates. And I came across a, a memo that he wrote to Carter saying, you know, I was all prepared after talking to Mondale, meeting him for the first time, I was all prepared to write off that guy. But I find that I can't. He liked him. And so he, you know, he recommended him over John Glenn and Muskie and some of the others. And, um, and Carter and he, uh, they obviously clicked. They had good chemistry. They had different kind of politics, different sensibilities. Um, you know, Mondale understood democratic farmer labor politics in Minnesota. He understood labor unions and, uh, and Carter had no 
feeling for labor unions and big labor and people like George Meany, but Mondale did. And, uh, but in any case, they, uh, they came to an agreement very early on during the transition period. And uh, Richard Moe, you know, I, I interviewed at length about this and he was the guy who wrote the, the, the memo that sort of outlined the, what Mon, how Mondale would function in the, the vice presidency. And, uh, you know, initially Mondale thought, oh, this is a long list of asks. I'll get some of it. But Carter sat down, read the memo and said, yeah, I agree with all of this. He got everything he wanted. And in fact, I also want you to have an office in, in, in the West Wing. And he got that. And, uh, you know, they played a very close, they had a very close partnership. Having said that, it's also true, I'm convinced that Mondale at one point seriously considered resigning because he was so frustrated with uh, the influence in, in the spring of 1979, uh, the influence of Pat Cadell that led to the famous Malay's speech that where Malay's wasn't actually uh, spoken of, but it's referred to as the Malay speech and the whole Camp David domestic summit, and which is again is an, an extraordinary event. It's just it's you know never happened. It it's classic Carter him uh, bringing together people and getting down on the floor in his jeans and and taking notes and and willing to accept self criticism and uh, trying to to figure out what was going wrong with the administration's direction. Why were people so um, disillusioned with, uh, with the way things were going? Uh, anyway, Mondale almost resigned. He, you know, he took a break for a week up in the wilderness area in Minnesota and changed his mind, but uh, it was, you know, so it was a, it was a close relationship um, and, but like any good partnership, they had they had their disagreements too. Mm -hmm. uh, just on that point, I've always felt, uh, and I think there's evidence to support this, that that, that so-called Malay speech, which as you point out, was not a word ever used as speech. I think actually Pat Cadell used it to describe the speech to right. reporters. Uh, the speech itself was a big hit. Uh, our numbers went up, and and uh, uh, I think the problem came about with the uh, wholesale sacking of the cabinet rather than more selective <coughs> targeting, shall we say? Right. Because uh, that 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 sort of caused people to wonder what the hell was going on. Uh, but the speech itself, I think, was successful. Uh, even reading it today, it's uh, sort of prescient. Um, yeah, it's a it's a really amazing speech in some ways. It's you know it talks sort of it questions the notion of American ex uh, exceptionalism. Uh, it it uh, talks about how Americans need to learn uh, that there are limits, that uh, materialism can't make you happy. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's a really, it's a very Carter speech, but it's, yeah, it's a very yeah. philosophical speech that still resonates to this day, speaks to our yeah. times, I think. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I want to ask one last question, then I'm going to turn it back to Jay, who I think now has power. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you wrote a, uh, I think it was in the Atlantic, I, I forget the publication, but you wrote a uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, letter to, to President Biden, uh, <laughs> right. uh, uh, sort of lessons from the Carter era. Do you want to, A, talk a little bit about that? And and, and then I'm going to ask you to tell us what you think about how Biden is doing on, pol not that policy, but politics. And then, and then I'll turn it back to Jay. Yeah, well, I had fun writing sort of an open letter to President Biden on you know, the lessons he could learn from the Carter presidency. And uh, I listed them in uh, sort of, as you say, tongue in cheek. Uh, you know, for instance, I suggested, you know, that President Biden 
shouldn't try to spend too much political capital bringing peace to the Palestinians, Israelis, because uh, it all all comes down to the settlements in the West Bank and the Israelis, you know, care more about the settlements than they do about peace. And so, <laughs> and, <clears throat> and then I sort of ended the, uh, ended the piece with a, a, a warning about if you find yourself uh, fishing on a pond and suddenly being attacked by a killer rabbit, don't defend yourself with an oar because uh, the press will make fun of you and Americans love their rabbits, even if they're killer rabbits. <laughs> they don't want you, to be, you don't want to be accused of animal abuse. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I had fun with. Anyway, I think Biden is actually a surprise to me because, uh, you know, Biden is the consummate politician. And he has been around for 40 years. Uh, <coughs> and we know this because he was actually one of the first sitting senators to endorse the then relatively dark horse candidate, Jimmy Carter in 1976 for the presidency. And they actually were good friends, were good friends. They were political allies. They had similar sort of political views um, on a, a number of tough issues, um, but Biden's reputation sort of over the years has been a, a man who, you know, has changed his politics, has dodged and weaved and um, uh, just the opposite of a Jimmy Carter who came into the White House determined to do the right thing as Jonathan Alter's book is entitled. Uh, <coughs> But now we have Biden who, I don't know, he's a man in his late 70s. Uh, he's been elected in an extraordinary period, you know, coming in the wake of this disaster of the Trump presidency. And he apparently really wants to do the right thing, regardless of the political consequences. And, you know, maybe he's thinking he's going to be too old to run for a second term. Or maybe he's thinking that, you know, I've been around the block enough to just, I, I, I think he's passionate. I think he's a man of, of uh, who, who has political beliefs and he's changed his positions on things, but he's become more liberal. And, uh, you know, I think he's doing a pretty good job at the moment. Great. Well, Kai, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. Uh, I want to turn this back over to Jay, but first, uh, everybody, uh, go to your favorite uh, bookseller and uh, and order the book. Tell your friends to order the book. Uh, it is it is a, it's terrific, as I say, when matched against uh, uh, the other books. I think goes a long way towards uh, helping the reappraisal of of. Uh, the Carter presidency and, and the time we all spent together. Uh, uh, but Jay Beck, if you are there and if you have power, do you want to wrap things up? Thank you, Les. I appreciate it. Sorry that my power is out for about 30 minutes of this call, but I am back. And uh, I wanted to thank you, Les, and your daughter, Kristen Carr, for putting all this together. It was a lot of work. I think your whole family got involved in it. Appreciate what you've done to give us all this opportunity. And Kai, thank you so much for your time and your, your generosity. And I can't wait to read your book. I would reiterate what Les said. Let's, let's go out and get this book. I think it's going to help us all, along with the other two that have recently come out, uh, and I help the public reappraisal of President Carter. Uh, just mentioning them briefly, um, they uh, have been in planes, uh, staying at home, they've gotten their shots. Uh, they've been, you know, very good about uh, not ex being exposed to COVID. They are now starting to get out a little bit, going back to church and a couple of public functions. Uh, they're doing exercises as their age and health will will permit. But uh, they're both looking forward to a 75th wedding anniversary coming up next month, about a month from now which is amazing in itself. And uh, I did want to let everybody on the call know where we'll take the recording of this and have it available 
on the Carter uh, website, the Jimmy Carter Library and Museum website uh, that you can access. It might take a few days for us to get it all together and packaged and put it up there. But we'll try to let everybody send you an email to let you know it's up there. In case you want to see it or like me, you missed half of it because you're in the dark. Uh, also, uh, there was a call of about 40 or so of Mondale staff uh, recently after he passed talking about him and what a wonderful man he was. And that Zoom call, uh, which is about two hours, a little over two hours, will also be available on the Jimmy Carter Library and Museum website. I think a lot of you on, on this call would might like to go and take a look at it. But again, I thank everyone for being here and uh, participating in this call, uh, Kai, Les, Kristen, thank you all and we really appreciate it. And we will be putting out a, a memorial uh, newsletter on Vice President Mondale, which will be coming out later this summer. Uh, thank you all. <laughs>